In this video, let's talk about virtual hard drives and remote collaboration with Lucidlink. All right, real quick, you're watching Video Brand. Special thanks to our sponsors for making this NAB coverage possible. Massive, Metricool, Adspective, Vestigit, and OpenReal. All right, back to the video. All right, I'm here with Matt from Lucidlink, and we're gonna talk about virtual storage. But first off, you wanna kind of give a high-level overview of what Lucidlink is. Uh, absolutely, thank you for um, ask, asking us to speak with you. So Lucidlink is real-time collaboration, known and familiar workflows with any creative tool you want, over distance without getting in the way of how creatives want to work. So anything that people are accustomed to in terms of getting data over distance, typically when you think about those workflows, you think about transferring data from point A to point B. You think about transfer tools that may be expensive. You think about um, old fashioned techniques like putting it on a hard drive. Everybody's been trying to solve this problem for over a decade. I used to work in post-production and we spent literally a decade tinkering with every tool in the tool toolkit trying to figure out how could creatives work over distance in a way that was known and familiar and comfortable to them without being disruptive in any way, shape or form to what they wanted to do and what seemed natural to them. So what we are doing is we are providing cloud storage, the infinite scalability of cloud, the resiliency of the cloud, the performance of the cloud, but it presents itself like a regular hard drive. This is not an alias of a hard drive, this is an actual hard drive at the operating system level. So when I look right here, and just to kind of get you guys oriented, this green desktop here, this really represents, this is a physical computer in this booth, it's right here under this desk. So think green as in grass, it's right here in Las Vegas. This blue desktop here represents a virtual machine that happens to be based in Germany. And what we're doing here at the show is we're showing these two different locations to really represent collaboration over distance. So this could be one creative in one location, this is another creative in another location. The other thing I'll mention is this also represents the administrator view and this represents the individual creative uh, creator's view. So, first and foremost, if data lives in our Lucidlink file space, it presents itself like a regular hard drive. So, without downloading, without syncing, sorry, without downloading or syncing, I open up my hard drive, I can browse into some content, and since I haven't needed to download or, or sync or pre-warm the data in any way, uh, shape, or form, I can actually go into the data, open up, and I am playing this directly from the cloud. I did not download, I did not sync, it wasn't necessary to do that in any way, shape, or form. And one of the truly unique things that we're doing here is that when we, when we or when anyone copies data to Lucidlink, we're doing something that is fundamentally different from anybody else here at NAB. We are taking this data and we are slicing it into tiny fragments. Each fragment is 256 kilobytes in size. And that gives us enormous flexibility to just deliver to the front-end application the minimum necessary to get real-time performance in the front-end tool without requiring the human element to download the whole thing from start to finish. You could have a, a file that is a terabyte in size, but we're just delivering the individual fragments as requested by the front-end application that is fundamentally different from what anybody else is doing here. Now, of course, you're going to ask yourself the question, great, this is terrific, but what if my bandwidth is mm. completely yeah. inadequate? That's the obvious question. And, I, mean, I knew your head was going the there. Here I could, I could bad, see so. the wheels turning. <laughs> we accommodate both scenarios. So in this particular case, this happens to be low bitrate material and our bandwidth is adequate and I can play it directly. When we pull down those fragments individually, just what's needed for the front end application, we're writing it to our cache. And the front end application has no idea what's going on, it's completely ignorant of the fact that this data is actually in the cloud, it is playing it from the local cache. And again, the, the efficiency there is you do not need to pull down the entire file from beginning to end just to get the real time performance here. But to that question, what if you don't have adequate bandwidth? Let's say you have a very heavy video file. It could be ProRes 444 RGB QuickTime. It could be an hour in duration, something very, very big. And let's say my, my bandwidth down is absurdly poor, 10 megabits down. Obviously, the laws of physics apply. You're not going to get real-time performance for something that heavy if your download bandwidth is that poor. That's okay. We have a second caching technology called pinning. Pinning will cache the entire file to your localized SSD or NVMe uh, storage. However, we are telling everybody here that that is fundamentally different from a conventional download. If you download something, that file is now out in the wild. You have no control of it, control over it anymore. So certainly from a security standpoint, from a content security standpoint, you really there's nothing you can do about that file and you cross your fingers and you hope that file stays in, in careful hands. But if data is pinned, 
you're not breaking the collaborative workflow. If you make any changes to that file, if you change the file name, you change the metadata, you add metadata, you subtract metadata, every collaborator in the world who's also working with you will see those changes near instantaneously and if the administrator takes access away, maybe the job is done, the project has concluded, that data, even though it's pinned, is completely inaccessible, poof, and it's gone. Fundamentally different from the conventional approach of downloading something. So that's why it is not downloading at all. You're not breaking the collaborative chain when you pin something in the event that you have completely inadequate bandwidth. So, those are two caching technologies that are quite unique to Lucidlink. It's caching it on the fly or it's caching the entire file and that's called pinning. But the fundamental difference here is that collaborative workflows can happen with the mouse click directly from the cloud without doing all the stuff that frankly we've all been taking for granted for over a decade. And take it from somebody who spent a lot of time in post-production trying to figure this out and make this better and reduce friction, this is the answer and this is why I came to Lucidlink. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, now, with the pinning, you have the control where you could pin file, folder, like if you're, oh, I'm actively working on this stuff and I have bad internet, I need to pin this. That you, that's on a file level control. Basically. File or folder, right click, you choose pin, and that will pull down the data. You can actually go back to your front end application simultaneously and continue to work where the data is being pinned in the background. And again, I also want to emphasize that you don't have to pin. That's only when the heaviness of the data exceeds your download bandwidth. That's how you would solve the poor bandwidth problem. But for the most part, you can just play the data directly from the cloud, assuming that your bandwidth is adequate for the bit rate of the content that you're trying to play. What's sort of been the kind of decent minimum baseline for bandwidth to have, uh, assuming you're not doing like ProRes 4444 or something? Doesn't matter. All, all that matters is if you have bandwidth that is equal to or greater than the bit rate of the content that you're trying to play, then you'll be able to get real-time performance directly from the cloud. If I have something lightweight, like XCAM 50 megabit, all right, and if my bandwidth is greater than 50 megabits, let's say it's 100 megabits, most, most people's homes have at least that in, you know, in a regular home environment, you should be able to play that content directly from the cloud without necessarily downloading it first. And so you're mounting it, it's mounted as a hard drive, it appears like any other hard drive on your computer. Uh, if you're also, so we were talking about video files, media files, if you're doing project files, you're, it's just a hard drive like any other hard drive, so if you were collaborating on project files, a Premiere project, a Final Cut library, that's still on you to manage how you want to, as far as like having, making sure like uh, two editors try, don't try to work on the same project file. Correct. So thankfully, all that, all that intelligence is actually owned by the front end application. So in the case of Adobe Premiere Pro, that tool is actually managing who has write permission to a particular project file, who doesn't, who has read only to a permission to a project file. That would extend to really any creative tool. So we're not getting involved with that by design. We're really the, 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 the collaboration infrastructure. That's what we're providing. The creative tools, they've got all that domain expertise in the creative tool. They know how to manage that in a shared storage context. And uh, we're on a PC right now. What are the other uh, We platforms? support all three operating systems, Mac, PC, Linux as well. Um, the way you get to the content, the way you mount the Lucidlink file space is through our installed desktop client. You authenticate with your user. You either use a Lucidlink user as part of a Lucidlink group. We also provide single sign-on integration with both Okta and Azure AD. Once you authenticate, the administrator is provisioned access. You get access to the content then it just appears as a hard drive. And from that point on, the workflow is entirely consistent with what creatives already know how to do and do well. Cool. And uh, pricing wise is basically, as you add more stuff, you just kind of pay per terabyte or it expands or per user? Correct, so we have two pricing plans. Our advanced plan is based on IBM storage. That's $80 a terabyte. That includes egress. That's the solution for best performance, real-time collaboration, real-time video editing, color correction, and so on. Um, the other plan that we have is the basic plan for $20 a terabyte. That's ideal for deep storage, long-term archival, or very low bit rate collaborative workflows. And then there's a lot of And both include the egress, by the way. They so, both include egress. So playing video by definition means egress. You're, you're reading from that equals egress. But if you work with those two plans, the egress is included. We also have a third option called custom. You bring your own storage. We work with anything, AWS, Google, Microsoft Azure, Backblaze, it doesn't make a difference. You can bring your own storage if you want to. They may charge you egress independently, which is why we would certainly encourage a customer to work with one of our, one of our two plans, the advanced or the basic. Yeah. Cool. Thanks a lot, Matt. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Great to meet you, yeah. and have a great show. Thanks, you too. Thanks for watching the video. For more of our NAB videos, be sure to check out our playlist with all the videos right here. And be sure to hit the subscribe button for more cool videos like this. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you in the next episode.